This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio. Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to another week of the X Zone, everyone, and to everyone listening in Canada and the United States. Happy Labor Day. This is the x a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. I'm sorry, from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight right here on the x Broadcast Network and the Starcom Radio Network. Toll free worldwide, 800-610-7035. My email address is x at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, X Zone Radio TV, and our radio site where you can listen to the X Zone 24 7, 365, as well as the live broadcast, www.xzoneradiotv.com. My first guest tonight is Catherine Samuelson. She is a highly attuned intuitive. She channels your personal angels and guides. Your angels and guides are uniquely sit- uh, suited to answer your questions and address your concerns. Catherine is also an effective and motivational life coach. She welcomes all clients, but specializes in helping those who are undergoing a transition in their lives, whether it is, let's say, a move, career change, or the loss of some type. Catherine is the co-creator, along with Linda Lewis, of Opening the Heart Meditations on How to Be, a book of exquisite meditation images and accompanying text. Catherine's unique combination of skills, training, and compassion allow her to ask questions that need to be asked and provide support and guidance her clients are seeking. Her website is katherinesamuelson.com, and joining me is Catherine Samuelson. Catherine, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, allowing me to chat with you tonight. So, Catherine, what was it in your journey that, let's see, you were you were you were uh, practicing yeah, I law? I used to practice law. Yeah, and, and <laughs> now and from law to psychic and life coach, um, that's like, <laughs> you know, that's that's like uh, adding uh, pomegranates to an order of French fries. <laughs> Certainly, a hundred and eighty degree turn. Yeah. Um, I frankly went to law school because I had a self-designed liberal arts major from the from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, and couldn't figure out what the heck to do with it. I, I suddenly, in my junior year, I was walking down the street and said, mm-hmm. "Oh, there's no way I can make a living with." <laughs> and sort of sorted through and like medicine's out. I'm not good at science, mm-hmm. and I, you know. And I ended up with law school, and it was a good journey for the period of time, but. I was always very attracted to the spiritual, the metaphysical, and at some point um, I got some indication that I should explore using automatic writing. For those who aren't familiar with it, it's you hold a pen, you center yourself, you open yourself to the metaphysical, the angels and guides, and they take over and start to write. And it was hit or miss at first and lots and lots of years of practice and I then moved from Illinois to Massachusetts and couldn't get a law job because, well, you're not from here. (laughs) Even though many of the people telling me that you're not from here, so we're not going to hire you, weren't from there uh, originally. Uh, Interesting. And so I started doing the life coaching and the the metaphysical work uh, and then ended up re-meeting Linda Lewis after five years of not seeing her. 
uh, and we created the book together um, with a lot of help, of course, from the angels and guides. So that's sort of the very short version of how I ended up here. <laughs> so what were some of the lessons that you learned on your journey? Um, practicing what I call radical ambiguity and radical persistence. Um, because, well, one of my personal issues has been sort of, you know, security, insecurity, mm -hmm. dealing with ambiguity, and, and trusting that following those practices and persisting will lead you where you need to be. Um, and another lesson is when you really, truly do your work and open up, the universe will step right up. Um, when the information came to me that I should create what was then called a set of angel cards, I said to the universe, well, I'm going to need an artist. Mm -hmm. And boom, I re-met Linda after five years. I, we were on a trip to Ireland together, had not spoken to her, had not seen her in five years. We had a little reunion of the group. And there you go. It's like we realized we're soul sisters. Um, and so that's some of the lessons. And that listening to your heart and really delving into it and finding out the story it wants to tell can help you move forward in your life. What types yeah. of guidance are you able to actually provide for your clients as a psychic? Uh, any number. I had a client today, and we were talking about diet and her mm -hmm. allergies and what, where those were coming from and what she could do to, you know, what did she need to do with her diet right now, you know, and, and where did they see her going uh, in terms of doing some of the work that she's been doing. We talked about issues with her grandchildren. Now, there are people who have a firm rule. If it's an adult person and they're not there to ask the question, then they won't do a reading about them. And I, when I first heard that rule, I asked my angels and guides, and they said, we can make that decision. And sometimes they will say to people, you don't know, need to know this. Um, I am not what I call a direct medium, but through the angels and guides, uh, I can find out information about people who've passed over. Uh, if somebody is searching out the next vocation or avocation, mm -hmm. uh, they can help with that. Um, so it's a whole range of things. And occasionally it's like, sorry, I'm just, it's blank today. You know, for some reason, you know, every reader goes through that once in a while. Um, you're not the reader for the person that day. Or, frankly, it's a piece of information that you don't need to know. Uh, it might be about someone else or you're not ready to hear. So, um, and one thing I try to tell my clients is, you know, none of us as readers are 100% accurate. Um, and somebody who tells you they are you should probably turn around and run away. But how can you decide whether or not someone is ready to hear something or not? Shouldn't that be up to the person? I don't decide that. Who does? You have to understand the angels and guides. Well, which angels do you work with? Uh, I work with my personal angels, my personal guides, and they connect with that person's angels and guides. It's not like I'm working with Archangel Michael mm -hmm. or Archangel Gabriel that some people do. I work with the rank-and-file angels, the ones who live with us every day. Um, it's kind of, if you think about it, it's like kind of spooky that they're around all the time. Um, every once in a while I'll say, can you just go in the other room for a little while? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> what's, what's the difference between an angel and a guide? Um... My analogy is that just as there are lots of different tribes of people mm -hmm. or groups of people on you know in the physical world, there are different tribes in the metaphysical world. So there are angels. There are what have been called to me spirit guides. They're not people who've passed over and are in spirit. They're another metaphysical entity. There's animal guides. Some people call them power animals. You know, they talk about animals animal medicine, mm -hmm. uh, totem animals, fairies, dragons, gnomes. So those are the groups they sort of lump under guides um, for people just because it gets a little long to say angels, fairies, dragons, animal guides. <laughs> gotcha. But who decides which angel and which guide stays with which person and guides which person? Um. My understanding is 
that sometimes it's the work that you're doing will attract them to mm-hmm. you. Sometimes they have frankly said, and they just, sometimes they'll say great mother, sometimes they'll say God. It, it's not as important to them, but they'll say God asked us to be here. So um, it's, it's something that happens in the medical metaphysical world. I wish I could describe it in detail for you, but in, to some level, it doesn't matter that much to me how they get here. I just know that they're here. What proof do you have that they're really there? <laughs> it's not a physical proof. Mm-hmm. Um, although one time when I was meditating, one of them reached out and lifted my because I had my head down and I could feel this hand lift my chin. Um, it's the things that they reveal that I know that can't come from me, that I have no clue um, how I know it. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's very hard in some ways to describe. Um, it's, it's kind of like, you know it when you see it kind of thing. Right. I wish, and I don't, I'm not trying to be flip about it, but mm-hmm. um, I'm not, I don't see them. Like there are people, I, other people who work in the field who, say they actually they, you know they'll see ghosts i don't see ghosts they see angels and guides i don't see them um it works differently for everybody some people hear them um but i just it's a sense of having worked with it long enough and having had it be a real process for me to come to this point that and when i'm doing the automatic writing they write through me much faster than i write when it's just me it's just like zip, 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 zip. Um, and I don't normally write that fast. Something I have a hard time trying to understand is why mm-hmm. so many different people who talk about angels have different techniques and methods. Some, like yourself, claim to mm-hmm. communicate with the everyday down-to-earth angels. Others talk about Archangel Gabriel, Archangel Michael, and... S- If all these people were communicating with angels, wouldn't they be communicating in the same way with all these different angels? I don't think so, because um, for me, the the automatic writing in some ways Mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me because I'm very verbal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I spent years writing as a lawyer. I've written poetry off and on. Right. So, uh, writing a book. So, it makes sense to me that the way I am called to do it is through writing. Now, having been a lawyer, you're very analytical. <laughs> you depend on seeing. You depend on proof. You depend on evidence. How can yeah. you? How can you, with any certainty, say that angels are real? What evidence, what proof have you yourself seen that would convince you beyond the shadow of the doubt that you are getting real messages from real angels? It's not things that I've seen. It's things that I have felt. Mm -hmm. It's uh, knowing that there are times when I'm working with them and working with the client, it's I feel my vibrations go up. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel things internally that I don't normally feel when I'm, you know, not working with them. Uh, And the truth is, I don't know that I can prove to anyone what I know. Let me, let me, sometimes we know things. Let me put it a different way. Let's say that you were, Mm -hmm. you were back as a lawyer, you're in a, you're in court. And the mm-hmm. opposing lawyer brings a witness to the witness stand and uses the example you just gave me to prove a case for angels. Would you believe her? Personally, yes, because of my experience. But, you know, I can't necessarily separate out my mm-hmm. personal experience from my experience as a lawyer. Right. Would it stand up in a court of law if that's what you're asking? No. But this, you know, I'm not operating in the court of law anymore. Right, right. So, 
But at, at times, do you find yourself in conflict based upon your past life and your present life? No. No, I... <laughs> And I can understand why you're asking that question because it is like this 180-degree turn. Yeah. But it's not as if it happened overnight. And it's not as if I didn't have uh, a deep belief in a creator and a deep belief in the creation, Mm -hmm. I suppose you could say. And to me, it makes, it just has always made sense. How has your work with angels changed your life personally? Well, I have moved twice. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am doing work that I did not used to do. I now have a book. I'm working on a couple more books where a lot of the information to me is clear. It's coming from some place outside myself, although it's from inside myself at the same time, if that makes sense to you. It does. Um, So uh, it, I am a lot calmer and more in tune with myself than I used to be. Uh, I'm certainly a lot happier in this work. Uh, Certainly (laughs) much happier than I was in the last job I had as a lawyer. (laughs) I I worked for a very bureaucratic local government, and it was mm, a little on the toxic side. Do you you think that the events of your life throughout your entire life have have prepared you for the path you're on right now? In some sense, yes, because I think one of the things that the law has done, especially doing the life coaching, Mm -hmm. it helps me see where people are going. It helps me ask questions. helps me, you know, help them clarify things. Um, But it also, I think, I think... It doesn't hurt when you're dealing with the metaphysical and people who are working in the metaphysical have a little bit of skepticism. Um, when I started this, it was it, for a long time, it was like, why me? Mm-hmm. And had to move into why not me? Um, and what was and the then, answer? What was the answer you, you gave yourself when you asked that question? It, why not me or why me? Well, why me was just sort of the initial, you know, like getting adjusted to mm-hmm. it. And I think the answer to that question was, was the next question, which is also a statement like, why not me? Sure. You know, if, because if we have a general plan for our lives when we come in, we incarnate in a particular lifetime, why not that I have agreed to do this work? Why not, you know? And uh, law, in a way, is a helping profession because it's, you do problem solving, you help people meet goals. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly what life coaching wants to do. Prior to your, your, prior to your work with the angels, did you believe in, in life contracts? Did you believe in reincarnation? No, but I came to believe in it. Why? Um, I have someone that I consult from time to time and being spontaneously told about previous lives and I would sit back and go, oh, wait, you know, and then doing the work that I've done with people where information will come through that some issue has some karmic ex- um, uh, echoes. Mm-hmm. Doing a lot of reading in Buddhism and Hinduism and other religions and finding out that actually, I haven't researched it myself, but apparently there were things about reincarnation in the Bible until the Catholic Church took them out. Well, uh, the, that, would, have, that is what is being said, but when it comes to proving that, that's a whole different ball of wax. Right, like, like I said. Yeah. I haven't researched it, and so you'd have, you know if you wanted to follow someone wanted to follow up on that, they'd have to do that themselves. Mm-hmm. There, are people who have made those claims. Um, but tell tell me, just, you know, why do you think people are looking towards angels, spirit guides, uh, psychics, 
mediums, channelers in the 21st century? Because to me, Mm -hmm. that even though there's this great technology out there, there is still the yearning of the soul, the yearning of the heart for contact and information and guidance that technology can't give us. I think it's an echo of the ancient coming into the, you know, into the modern times. Mm-hmm. I think that there are certain kinds of, at the ground level, that there are certain kinds of transformations that are happening. Uh, people working in collaboration and transition towns of sustainability um, and reaching out for that kind of contact. And I think that reaching out is reaching out not just to other people, but out to the metaphysical physical world. Um, there's a really nice image that Barbara Brown Taylor, who wrote a book, she's written several books. One is called An Altar in the World. And she uses the phrase, the great luminous web that holds everything together. And I, to me, if we're going to have true connection, mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense to only have connection on the physical level you need connection on the emotional the mental and to me on the metaphysical level so what do you say to people who are claiming that the that whenever there are crises in the world that people who cannot understand or who do not want to accept the reality of what is going on they tend to go towards the fringe the metaphysical Example, at the end of, uh, you know, during World War I, the Ouija board came out, and it was a big hit because people believed they could contact those who had passed. Um, mediumship was big. Once again, the loss of life, the inability to cope or to accept the fact that someone has left. Others believe that the metaphysical is being used as a method of grieving, how, how you know like think, how do you see it? I think there are some people that it's that they feel if they can have the contact through the mm-hmm. mediumship then they can get some closure. Um, I think it's partly the yearning for that continued connection, the connection to the metaphysical. I think there is something in humanity that says there is more. And this is one way to seek out the more. But what happens if the metaphysical isn't the answer? It's not the more that people are searching for. Can we do more harm than good? That's a very interesting question, which I have never thought about Mm. before. But from my viewpoint, I think it's hard to say a definitive yes or no because... Part of it depends on the practitioner. Right. And part of it depends on the person doing the seeking. If you, it's like anything. If, if, if you don't have a strong base in yourself, you can be easily thrown off base, so to speak. Right. If you're not, you know, if you, there are scam artists in the metaphysical world, just as there are scam artists in everywhere. Every sure. Right. So, again, I think with the right practitioner and the right seeker, it is useful and helpful and can be healing. Mm-hmm. But if you have the wrong one, you know, the, quote, wrong one, yeah, and somebody who's not strong enough to say, whoa, wait a minute, it can be harmful. So... Well, would you say I that... Don't like it. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Finish what you were saying, dear. I mean, uh, that's why I can't give you a definitive, you know, totally not helpful or totally helpful because it's like life. It depends. So would you would you say that people who seek out answers in the realm of the metaphysical are weak or would you classify no. them as being strong? I, I don't think you can make a blanket statement about it. Anybody. Well, why would you know, a strong everybody who, why would a strong person who has confidence in themselves, confidence in their surroundings, their life is good, everything is going their way. Why would they need the help of a metaphysical practitioner? 
They might not, but they may be at a crossroads in their life, which would, again, you could choose a metaphysical mm-hmm. practitioner or a life coach, that you know, they know that you know, this part of their path is ending, and they're a little up in the air about where to go next. So it can provide guidance. They might want to tweak mm-hmm. something in their life, and say, they might come and say, you know, what do the angels and guides have to say about my doing this, you know, as the next step? Sure. So there, there are reasons. Are, are, do you think that in some circumstances the metaphysical is starting to replace religious uh, philosophies and replace religious guidance? I think for some people, but I think some people it's a complementary. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think there is a spiritual yearning in people, a uh, mm-hmm. religious yearning, um, and people. Uh, I used to. I grew up as a Methodist, and I believe firmly in Christ. But there were things I realized that even in the Methodist doctrine that mm-hmm. I just couldn't believe in. So I'm no longer a practicing Methodist, but. Do I still believe in Christ? Yes. Uh, is the metaphysical a replacement for that? It could be. Uh, it certainly might be for some people. Uh, for me, it was just time to leave that piece of my path. Uh, of course, there are all the stories about you know, you know, people leaving the Catholic Church, coming back to the Catholic oh, sure. Church, seeking out Buddhism, which is interesting. The Dalai Lama. I've read quotes. A quote several times where he said you should be in the religion you grew up in, which is interesting. I find that a lot of people go from religion to religion to religion to religion because they're not getting the answers that they want to get. It's not that the answer isn't being presented to them. It's not that's what they don't want to hear. That's like people who go to psychic fairs and I I used to bring the show to psychic fairs and we'd watch people start at one end of the tables and go from psychic to psychic to psychic to psychic to psychic to psychic. psychic. And I always knew when that person heard what they wanted to hear, no matter how much it cost them. And no matter that every other psychic told them the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do some uh, telephone readings on Best Psychic Directory. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and there was a guy who called me and asked a question, and he said, well, why are you giving me this answer when the two psychics I talked to yesterday said the opposite? And, like, I blocked him because he was psychic shopping, yeah. you know. And I will tell people, you know, I had a client who had a reading, and she wanted And I said, no, I think you need to wait at least a couple of weeks to integrate this, sure. you know, because I don't want people to be dependent on me. Catherine, stand by. You and I have to take our commercial break at the bottom with the news. Exo Nation, Catherine Samuelson is our guest, www.catherinesamuelson.com. She is also the author of a book that we're going to be talking about on the other side of the news, Opening the Heart, Meditations on How to Be. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network, the Digital Broadcast Network, Digital Satellite Network, and on our good friends at the Starcom Radio Network. The Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard, will be back on the other side as we continue from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com 
you like to be able to read other people's minds well the next best thing is here when you know how to read a person's name you know how the person thinks feels and behaves each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names including the first and last impression people remember about us Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. The ability to access the knowledge of the universe is much easier for us to access than we may believe. Brad Johnson, Conscious Matrix Communicator, is one of these unique individuals who is able to access a strong connection to the universal mind. Through his connection, Brad has assisted thousands of clients from all over the world through natural intuitive assistance. The intuitive information received is vast, covering a wide range of subjects. Brad's innate ability includes being able to access one's own universal matrix to help them realize their potential to create a life of profound greatness. One-on-one private sessions with Brad Johnson are available to anyone from around the world. Brad is also a proficiently trained psychic, Akashic Records reader, an online spiritual teacher, founder of his own unique and powerful healing system, Body Regeneration Healing, as well as a professional conscious channeler in communication with his own higher self-consciousness known as Adronis. For more information or to book a service appointment with Brad Johnson, visit his website at www.consciousmatrix.com. That's www.consciousmatrix.com. Jeff Gilson didn't go out looking for adventure, danger, or the answers to most of the controversial political intrigues of the past 30 years. But he found all three when he began investigating the mysterious death of his close friend, Margaret Thatcher's favorite speechwriter. Just an ordinary guy living in a small, sleepy suburb 20 miles outside of London, Jeff's questions provoked a powerful response on both sides of the Atlantic. He was shot at, warned off by the CIA, and formed a close bond with one of Israel's most notorious intelligence officers. Relive Jeff's gripping adventure in his fast-paced book, Maggie's Hammer. Peel away the layers of establishment deception and discover, as Jeff did, that his friend was an assassin with British intelligence, that Great Britain has been America's secret hitman for the past 30 years, and that Princess Diana was not the target in that Parisian tunnel. All of this and more when you visit www.maggieshammer.com and find the link to buying this explosive book online. More and more ordinary people feel they no longer have control of their lives. Jeff fought back. He asked the difficult questions. He set out to redesign his own destiny. And you can do the same using Maggie's Hammer as your guide. Don't waste a moment. Buy it today. Visit www.maggieshammer.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. 
Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Welcome back, everyone. Catherine Samuelson is our guest this hour. Her website is CatherineSamuelson.com. She is a, let me see, she's a life coach. She does angel readings. She is a psychic. And she's also the author of Opening the Heart, Meditations on How to Be. Once again, her website is CatherineSamuelson.com. Catherine, what does a life coach do? Um, a life coach can do a number of things. Um, but it's one of those professions where you have to be careful of um, boundaries. Mm-hmm. We're not therapists. We're not lawyers. Right. Uh, but uh, kind of a guide, I think, is a, is a, is a good description of it. Could, could we also somebody. classify a, um, a, um, a life coach as a consultant? Yes. Um, somebody who you can counsel with without mm-hmm. being a therapist, uh, that you have a client who has a goal. So you can, if they have a definitive goal, they know what their goal is, you can help them break down steps of how to reach it, how to give themselves a break if they don't do the Mm -hmm. step when they want to do it. You act as a nudge. You ask pertinent questions. You help them keep on track towards their goal. If they're floundering, you can help them find out what their goal is and how to move out of being floundering. Uh, I give what I call homework. <clears throat> they have things to do. I mean, once I had a client, and her homework was to start opening those boxes that she had moved over oh, two years. And the first box she opened up was a bunch of photographs, and it helped her realize that she really, where she really wanted to be living. So then, the goal became for me to assist her into making that move that she wanted to make and support her in that. Um, It can help somebody figure out how to organize themselves. Uh, You make suggestions. Some people want you to tell them what to do. Other people, it's appropriate to say, well, maybe you could consider doing X or you could consider doing Y, you know, and to step back, to be that support, to be a a support system Mm -hmm. without being... Stepping over the line and become the, becoming a friend. Well, what's that the difference sense. then between a life coach and a therapist? Because there are so many parallels here. There are, but there are issues. For example, I had someone, because of a piece of homework that I gave her, mm-hmm. she started to raise up childhood abuse issues. And I had to say, I want to be here for you, but I cannot help you with that. But didn't you open I'm the not door? Trained. But didn't you open that door? In in a way, she opened the door herself because the homework reminded her of this. Well, if she had not gone to you, if she had not gone to you, Mm -hmm. would that past memory have been surfaced? I don't know that it was ever not there. It was the realization that she needed to work on it that came clear to her. Um, It's. A therapist, like a psychologist, Mm -hmm. has a lot more training in that area of work that a life coach doesn't. Um, There is some closeness, and I will agree with that, but it's, it's again, having that that boundary that says, I can help you this far, and I can support you in helping you find a therapist. I can support you, you know in the ways that I can do that, but I am not a therapist. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, you have to have firm boundaries here. 
So uh, I'm having too. a bit of a problem understanding why someone would go mm-hmm. to a life coach instead of going to a therapist. Therapists are licensed, are governed. They are responsible mm-hmm. for anything that goes wrong. They know how to treat or they can, they've certainly had a lot more training than a life coach. You know, there's no courses mm-hmm. for life coaches in university or, or any degrees that I'm aware of. Uh, so why would well, a per- actually I did, I, I did my um, training as a life coach at uh, University of New Hampshire. Um, and I can see what your, yeah. your question is. And if someone needs that kind of help for a therapist, they mm-hmm. should be going to a therapist. Clearly, they should be going to a therapist. But if what they're working on does not rise to that level, it's you know helping somebody organize themselves, helping somebody keep track of their goals and nudging them, Mm-hmm. then, you know, a life coach is appropriate. How? How is a life coach appropriate? If somebody has issues that they need a resolution with, uh, whether it be uh, in the business world, okay, then you go see a business consultant or a financial consultant. I, I, from what I understand, life coaching covers a broad spectrum. Well, most of us specialize in something. There are, you know, people who coach executives. Mm-hmm. They do professional coaching. They do. There are coaches who do business, the business consulting coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are those of us who work with people, helping them transition. Uh, what kind so, of transition? Well, like the client I said, who decided that she wanted to to move to a certain location. Mm-hmm. So it was my supporting her in figuring out how she was going to do that, what she was going to go look for, um, people to contact to help her get back there, right. that kind of thing. In, in basic, kind of basic life skills sometimes. Well, but, you know... Once again, I'm going to say it's the 21st century. Do we really need that kind of life coach skills from outsiders? Can't we go to friends? Can't we go to family? Can't we go to to um, our, our church leaders to get the same support and the same guidance? To a certain extent, you can. But if you are working and it's a process and it needs to happen over a period of time, mm-hmm. at some point it becomes hard for your family and friends to continue that journey with you, to continue. It's good to be the third-party objective person uh, who's not saying, you know, because sometimes as a life coach you have to say, you want to rethink that (laughs) and ask the questions that family and friends might not ask because they're, you know. And sometimes you have... Sturm and Drang with your family, and they're not going to be able to help you sort that out. So someone would then find a life coach that they feel they feel comfortable with, who has their their interest at at heart, I would imagine. But how does how does somebody find a responsible and respectable life coach, like anybody with? What is it? Less than twenty bucks now can open up a website. Say, "Hey, I'm a life coach." So how do, how do, how does somebody uh, find a reputable one? Like, there's no licensing requirements. There's no professional organizations that they can go to. Right, but for example, someone like me. I mean, I do have the law degree. I do have the law practice. So there mm-hmm. is that part of it. Um, but also, I have a certification from the University of New Hampshire. So you would want to look at where this person got training. Mm-hmm. Um, when somebody approaches me about being a life coach, I say we need to either meet in person or on the phone, and we need to talk about what you're looking for to see if we want to work together. So if somebody just tries to suck you into mm-hmm. the life coaching process um, and you want somebody who's going to be honest about what they can do, I had somebody we did a phone consultation and she wanted me to guarantee her a result at the end of three months. And I said, I can't guarantee that. What I can guarantee is I will help you get as close as possible to that. And that's not what she wanted to hear. Right. Because frankly, um, I can't make things happen for someone. I can assist them in that process. So part of it is 
listening to your own internal sense of is this person for me? Um, and you know, did they just set this up, or do they have a certification from somewhere? Uh, mine is from a, an accredited university, mm -hmm. and it's a you know an, a part of their program. Um, and so, I would think that kind of thing might give someone a little comfort level. How long uh, of a process does life coaching usually take or last with a client? It can vary. It can be as little as a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be longer that that. And I had a client recently. I said where I said to her, I said, I, "You know, we've been doing this for a while, and my goal is not that you should be doing this forever." So you know, I you know wanted to bring that up with you because. We've been doing it for a while, and this, you know, this shouldn't be going on for years and years and years, you know. So, uh, part of it is based on what the client needs, but I also think if you find that you've been working with a life coach for six years, there might be something a little off there, you know. And if the life coach hasn't raised it much, much earlier than that, that really this process is going on for quite some time, and you know, at some point we need to wean you away from me. So how do you how do you stop it from becoming a, a habit and where you are no longer a life coach but a crutch? You have these kinds of conversations every so often, and you make an assessment about how well the client is doing. Yeah. Um, you uh, might say, "Okay, we've been doing this every two weeks for a bit. We're going to try. Let's see how you feel about this for every three weeks," and you just do that kind of process as well. Gotcha. But you 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 make sure that it's the client's decision to continue and that you're just not suck you know, at least in my view. So somebody should be looking for somebody who doesn't want it to be a forever situation. It's not like analysis where you know you hear about people who've been in analysis and they've been in analysis for ten, twenty years. Right. Like, oh my God. You know should not be that kind of situation. And part of it depends on the person's goals. You know, it could be very short term. It could be three months. It could be six months a year. It, 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 it really kind of depends on what their, their goals are. How would a life coach protect from using or, or from using their own life solutions that may be detrimental to the client. Not a, not everything works for everybody the same way. What works for me may not work for my brother. What may work for my brother may not work for my sister in law. So how do we how do how do life coaches put up that wall where it's the client's best interest, not necessarily the life coach's best interest, but the client's best interest. I like that question. That's, that's something that both coaches and the clients need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I have as a rule is the time is not about me. It's about the client. Right. And I will, if it is pertinent, I might say, I'm only telling you this story because it's illustrative of, you know, I've been there, so I, that I understand this feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, for example, I had a client who really needed to organize her tax stuff or needed to organize certain things, and I said, you know, this is an example of how this can happen, but we need to make this in a, happen in a way your paperwork is organized so that it makes sense to you. You know, and mm -hmm. so this is one way that you can do it. This is another way you can do it. It's providing options. Let's talk about your book, Opening the Heart, Meditations on How to Be. What is the goal mm -hmm. of your book? The goal of the book is to help someone go deep within themselves, to go into their hearts, to see the information that the heart holds for you. It's to help you... See how you want to be in relation to yourself, to others, to the world, to the divine. Uh, I've become more convinced, you know, using it myself through the process, that it can help you become 
kind, compassionate, uh, generous, uh, to be deep, more deeply connected is, you know, in this great luminous web that um, I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. It, um, Sally Kempton has a book called Meditation for the Love of It, and she talks about everybody has a different gateway into meditation. And I see opening the heart as a different gateway for people to find their ways into meditation and to find their ways to the information, the knowledge, the wisdom that can come to you through meditation. Um, but what about those people? Just, what about those people who don't believe in meditation? That it's a bunch of bunk. It's a bunch of hooey. You know, what, <laughs> what, what about those people? Then I don't know that opening the heart could help them because yeah, I you have to have a certain openness of mind to reach in the open heart. I but think just because you don't sense. believe in meditation doesn't mean you have an your heart's not opened. Right, but. As I said, people have a diff- people have different gateways to find where they need to go, mm-hmm. and just as I would hope that opening the heart is for everyone, there are probably people, uh, you know, there are probably people that it's not for. Yeah, but and I don't want to push it on them. Yeah, but opening the heart uh, isn't it possible to open the heart without going through meditation? Like, come I on, I suppose it. I suppose it is for some people, but again, this is a tool that you can use. It's mm-hmm. that, you know, it it's not a. I would be the first person to say it's not the tool for every person in the world, or you know, it is a tool for seekers. Um, but that, once once again, let me ask you, counselor: Does the seeker need to subscribe to meditation, and if so, why? Um, meditation is a tool. There's mm-hmm. prayer, there's contemplation. They're all on a continuum. You could use opening the heart uh, as a means of contemplation. Mm-hmm. Uh, contemplation is in, uh, certainly a tool in the Christian tradition right. where you contemplate text, you contemplate um, icons. Yeah. Um, so it could be reused in any range of ways. Why I'll ask you, why I'm asking you about the the meditation. I, I've had many people on the show who do not believe that meditation is the answer to everything. Man, you were just talking about opening the heart, and that's a beautiful title for your book, by the way. Christmas time. Well, Open, I, it, it, wait yeah, a second. Hold on, here, hold on here. Hold on here. Okay. Hold on here. Christmas time opens the hearts. And meditation is not involved. Looking at a looking at a little puppy opens a heart. No meditation. Doing an act of kindness opens the heart. No meditation. Doing something good to help another person opens up the heart. Meditation not required. So why is meditation and so I important? I, and I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Again, meditation is a tool. It is one of many tools. And meditation is a wonderful mm-hmm. result. Would meditation be equal to you know, prayer? Just even on the physical level. It lowers blood pressure. It, it helps you be calm. Mm-hmm. It helps you get in touch with the higher self, which can happen through prayer. Yeah. It can happen through trance dance. Mm-hmm. Meditation is a tool. And I'm not one to claim that it's the only tool, but it's a tool. But um, are you saying in order to appreciate your book and to to um, to utilize the tool to its best ability, being your book, that meditation should be part of someone's life? I'm not into shoulds. Okay. <laughs> I think Would you say that meditation is a prerequisite? Be. Hello. Yeah, I know. I was just asking you if mm. if meditation. No, I, I didn't hear. I didn't hear all. I thought there was more to your. your, your I think, no. So you're saying. No, I was um, just you know. Meditation. Meditation is use. Meditation is useful. 
it is an excellent thing to engage in, mm -hmm. um, but it's not necessarily something that absolutely every person has to do. You may do it for a while right. and not do it. You may never do it, mm -hmm. um, but obviously I believe firmly in meditation and the benefits of meditation. I believe firmly. Did you use meditation prior? To, um, did you believe and did you practice meditation prior to becoming involved in the metaphysical world? It happened at about the same time. Yes, sir. But as I said, I used to I used to pray. Mm -hmm. I used to pray. Prayer. To me, prayer, meditation, and contemplation are all of a piece. They're on a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all access points. Gotcha. It's time that you and I must say so long for tonight, uh, Catherine. I want to wish you much success. Let, your, let our listeners know how they can get a copy of your book and contact you for more information. Okay. It's CatherineSamuelson.com, and it's K. K A T H R Y N S A M U E L S O N. The book is available through my website. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and it's paperback and it's also an e version, so it's Kindle, Nook, and iBooks. All right, Catherine, thanks a lot for joining us. Continued success, and uh, let me see. You know what? When it comes to meditation, Exxon Nation, I guess it's a matter of choice. If you want to pray, you pray. If you want to meditate, meditate. If you want to think, think. Whatever floats your boat, right? We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. My email address is X-Zone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And uh, don't forget, Exxon Nation, Wednesday, September the 30th, from 8 p.m. until 10 p.m., the debate of the UFO world. Stanton T. Friedman is debating with or against, it's up to you how you figure this one out, Michael Horn. The topic of the debate is the Billy Meyer case. Hmm. Send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our radio website, www.exxonradiotv.com. And the Exxon is heard Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Digital Broadcast Network, Digital Satellite Network, and the Starcom Radio Network. My name is Rob McConnell. I'll be back on the other side of the news at the top of the hour. Don't go away. Thank you.